Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this planet. I'm Andres de Troy at the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of the Western Cape. And uh, I bid you welcome to this webinar in which um, we discuss the challenges, the questions, the problems facing those surviving at the margins of the capitalist system in sub-Saharan Africa during the time of the coronavirus. Uh, you will remember that uh, last week, my colleagues Ruth Hall and Muniba Isaacs uh, interviewed our panelists from NELGA, the Network of Excellence in Land Governance in Africa, about food security in Africa in the COVID-19 crisis. Now, that discussion focused largely on the production side of things. Uh, it focused on farmers, uh, farmers' livelihoods, um, uh, and uh, farming inputs, and, and how that was impacted by, by lockdowns and, and the virus itself. Today, uh, we are moving away from the farmers, we are visiting the city, and we are looking at what happens to consumer food environments, uh, and to the ability of poor and marginalized people to get access to the nutritious and healthy food they need. And um, to join me in this discussion, I have two very knowledgeable and interesting guests. Um, firstly, um, uh, Dr. Reggie Anan, uh, researcher at the Kwame Nkrumah uh, University for Science and Technology in Kumasi, Ghana. Uh, good morning, Reggie. It's still morning where you are. It's very good to have you here. Uh, and we also have here, here my colleague, uh, Florian Kroll, who is a postgraduate student at PLOS at the uh, at UWC. Uh, Flo, it's good to see you as well. Um, and I should also say that um, our discussion uh, here um, should have a, a fourth person present, um, yet another man, so it would have been a four person manual, but I do want to, to mention his name. Uh, uh, my friend uh, and colleague, uh, the late Professor David Saunders, who unfortunately can't be with us. He passed away just about a year ago. Uh, quite untimely. David was a person who spent his entire life fighting for a people-oriented food system. In other words, he saw public health as something that was produced together by citizens and the government. People should not simply be objects of biomedical intervention. They shouldn't just be subjects of administrative action. People should be partners. They should be agents uh, in their own health, and they should be involved as, as citizens in the creation of public health. Uh, and at the near the end of his life, one of the last projects that David was part of creating was the project that we're going to discuss today. It bore the rather ungainly name of ROF, Researching Obesogenic Food Environments. Uh, and it tried to understand um, the factors that impacted uh, the ability of people to get uh, healthy and nutritious um, uh, food in two cities. Uh, um, Kumasi, Ghana, and Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, um, so before we go, go down to what's happening in the time of COVID, uh, Reggie, I'd like you to just um, uh, take us to uh, discuss to us why this project, why should we be worried about obesogenic food environments? Why does this matter? Um, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Andreas, for, for having me, and I'm um, very privileged to be part of this discussion. Um, well, we all know about the dual burden of malnutrition being faced in different um, parts of the world, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where Ghana is, where South Africa is. Um, so we have stunting and undernutrition, and at the same time, we also have overweight and obesity, which are both on the rise. And we haven't addressed that stunting, but we're also uh, struggling to and, and obesity is increasing. We, we know that the um, stunted children are likely to grow up into you know, obese adults because they are short. And the relationship between obesity and overweight and non-communicable diseases are also well established. And people who are obese are likely to have a higher risk for you know, diabetes and, and heart diseases and some cancers. And we also know that food systems are changing and they because dietary intake and physical inactivity um, are related to obesity. And we know food systems are changing and because of the transition and, and this is promoting obesity in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
um, but we don't know how much and, and, and we don't understand how well these changes are. And it is clear that the neighboring um, neighborhood food environment um, affects what people uh, have access to and therefore what they eat. And this is not, this is not well understood. So the raw, the raw fish study, which is, which is researching obesogenic food environments, which we've been implementing in South Africa and Ghana over the past three years, um, was to better understand the changing nature of food marketed um, in poor communities in South, in South Africa and Ghana, and to understand the drivers of these changes because understanding these uh, the drivers of the changes will then provide the the potential policy levers that can be you know recommended to promote the food environment and and therefore and then address obesity and overweight and the ROFI study we we had for uh, three phases the first phase um, which I'll share a few some of the key findings of for this phase was to explore the types of foods that people are consuming and are purchasing and the local food environment, food availability, food access, and how the, um, the availability and access affect decision-making on when and what to buy and, and why um, to buy. And we chose two rural communities, one in South Africa and one in, in Ghana. Ghana, we had Adretia and um, Ahunt, and, 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 and in South Africa, we had Mount Frey. And then in, in, for the urban communities, which one was um, Ghana and also one in, in South, South Africa, Kailisha in South Africa and Ahunjo in, in Ghana. And we had 300, and, and 300 and households in each of the com communities. So making 600 in Ghana and 600 um, in, in South Africa. And what are the key findings for for the um, for this study? We have found that about you know consumption of obesogenic foods is really widespread in 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 Ahujo, the urban area in Ghana. More than twenty five percent consume regularly high risk foods, um, based on the Nova classification. In Kailisha, this was more up to um, almost about seventy percent. Um, of people, but very few people in both uh, com countries and um, both communities are consuming um, healthy um, foods, it's again, based on the same classification. And we also found that um, access um, definitely affects what people are consuming. Um, yeah. and the, the retail um, joints and then the wholesale um, uh, joints for these foods are widespread in the two communities. And people choose based on uh, what is available and what um, they can access in yeah. these communities. So, so you, were, you were looking really at the factors that impact non-communicable diseases, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. Then, and all of a sudden, a communicable disease made its appearance, um, a completely disorganizing all of our plans. And in a way, what meant is that you had a, a ringside seat on, on how these food systems and these food environments were being transformed um, by the virus itself and also by responses to the virus. Uh, so um, fascinating as it might be to look at the, the broader questions and we'll return to them. I'd like to zoom in a little bit to the question of, uh, of how, uh, how did food systems change and how did people's access to food change as a result to food, uh, uh, as, a res as a result of the response to the COVID-19 crisis. And one of the things that's interesting here is that we see a very different picture between South Africa and Ghana, two very different food systems, but also two very different kinds of response to the virus. So there's plenty of interest, there are plenty of confounding factors, but there's also plenty of, uh, of interesting lessons to learn. And I'd like to begin that story really in Cape Town. Flo, could you describe to us uh, what you saw in terms of firstly of the response to the virus and how this affected people's access to food? Yeah, thanks, Andres. Um, well, as South Africans are aware, we entered a very radical hard lockdown um, quite early. And uh, this uh, lockdown was uh, enacted through a set of regulations which um, 
stated quite clearly, actually, that the provision of food was one of the essential services that was to be maintained. Um, however, the regulations entailed a lot of um, ambiguity concerning specifically the informal sector um, and particularly street traders and, and the selling of, of hot food, um, prepared food. And uh, so the regulations initially were very permissive towards uh, supermarkets and the formal retail sector. But um, informal retail was, was closed down really, really quickly. And uh, this is really a, a huge issue um, for, for people in the poorer parts of the country. And that is the majority of our population, actually, um, for several reasons. The, the first being uh, just access of food. The informal sector, and in South Africa, that is primarily comprised of uh, so-called spaza shops, small shops that operate usually out of people's homes, and of street traders. Um, and these are the uh, probably most important source of food or, or access points of food on a regular basis for poorer people, um, especially in, in the so-called township areas. Um, because they provide food in quantities that um, are affordable, um, because they are available locally, literally on people's doorstep. There's, you know, in, in most townships, there's very few homes that are more than five or ten minutes walk away from a Spaza outlet. Um, and they, they also cultivate uh, strong social networks uh, within their communities. So sometimes people are able to, to access food even on credit. So with the lockdown, Initially, these, um, all of these food outlets were closed down. Um, and street traders, and this is something that our research, uh, the ROF research, revealed very clearly, is that the street traders are a key source um, of access to fresh fruit and vegetables um, for people in these communities, which is important um, in the context of a communicable disease of a viral nature like COVID, because our immune response is obviously mediated by our access to healthy nutrition and micronutrients in particular. So it was, it was problematic from that perspective um, in that all of a sudden, the majority of the population was not able to access food in the conventional ways that it was accustomed to. Um, and the regulations essentially required people to travel fairly long distances in some cases to access food in supermarkets and supermarkets on the other hand, had um, implemented uh, measures to reduce trade in, in their shops um, by having basically keeping people out of, the, out of the shops and only allowing a certain number of people in at a time. So people began queuing outside of supermarkets. So this has had another maybe unintended consequence in that many people were now uh, forced to travel in uh, enclosed conditions in, in uh, taxis, public transport, um, and, and thereby expose themselves to greater infection risk, and to queue outside of shopping centers, often also not being able to follow um, the physical distancing regulations. And um, in addition to that, people who are already very often quite poor and barely able to afford food um, had to spend more on transport to get to these supermarkets. This was the one impact, the most immediate impact in terms of food access. Um, the, the other impact was on the livelihoods of informal traders. And we've had feedback from a number of um, colleagues working in that sector and representatives of that sector just um, expressing their deep struggles um, and that many of them uh, have had to use the operational capital um, with which they would normally restock produce just in order to feed their own families and in order to cover their costs of rental and other things. So many of these traders are now really struggling to resume business even though the lockdown has been eased. Uh, so it's had a major impact on the livelihoods of people. And to compound these matters, um, the lockdown has also meant that many people have not been able to work. And uh, a recent survey carried out by University of Johannesburg and the HSRC has shown that I think it was 
close on 13% of people, I might be wrong about the exact stats, but a significant number of people have actually been laid off, have been told that they cannot work and that they will not be paid. Um, so these are a lot of the people working in the casual sector, peace jobs, uh, but also in the informal sector have now lost income and therefore are not able to, to purchase food. So we've seen a huge spike in the experience of, of hunger as a result of this, where previously we were dealing with some hunger uh, and, and our survey showed that a small percentage was indeed experiencing hunger, but a larger percentage in, in our country experienced food insecurity, meaning that they experience anxiety and uncertainty about where to get food. Um, and as a result of the, this lockdown, that food insecurity has turned into abject hunger for a huge number of people. And um, this is then contributing towards conditions where people's resilience to um, this infectious illness is being undermined, uh, where we are experiencing social tensions around these issues. Um, and um, where we are experiencing the, the possible collapse of the informal economy, or a part of it at least, and from a structural perspective, the further consolidation of large food corporations, which already are pre-COVID, have been highly consolidated and have demonstrated cartelistic tendencies. So this is of major concern also going forward. Um, and I, I just wanted to add that they, the conditions that Reggie mentioned with regards to the high degree of consumption of obesogenic foods in our country has essentially primed our population to be highly susceptible to COVID. Um, and the, you know, the high prevalence of non-communicable illnesses like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and so forth are creating a, a condition where a large proportion of our population are in fact at serious risk of this illness. And um, so this is posing significant public health threats at the moment. And um, this is fundamentally an issue that has emerged out of food systems and which is being exacerbated by our food systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. So so in a way, one of the things that you're, 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 you've been emphasizing is the the great fragility that was exposed uh, particularly on the in, in the informal economy and the and the informal food system uh, uh, and uh, in the paper that you are currently um, uh, developing there's a market contrast between the south african story and the story in kumasi reggie do you want to take us through uh, what covid 19 meant in ghana addressing both the nature of the lockdown and also how food systems responded yes uh, thanks um and well the, the response to the, the the pandemic in between the two countries um is quite different for instance in ghana we didn't have a total lockdown there was they said it was restricted movement and that was to mean that people could still go out and buy food and Flo said um, that uh, in South Africa, the informal food vendors are key um, um, uh, uh, source of access to, to food. And the same is Ghana. But in Ghana, they were not touched. They were to continue but, um, uh, selling. So anybody could go out. And if the police meets you, tell them you're going to buy food, then you are allowed to go on and buy the food. Secondly, the, the, the restriction was also limited to the two main cities in Ghana where they felt that the, 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 the numbers were high. So that's Kumasi and Accra. The rest of the country uh, were not on lockdown or restricted movement, and therefore people would go around and then access um, food. So you see, uh, and then the third, the, fact, the third thing was also was that the peace and restricted movement was cut short after three weeks because again of the vulnerability seeing that even with this um little movement those that were very vulnerable such as people who depend on you know daily uh, trading for their livelihood were now going to um be um, in uh, increased vulnerability so the lockdown was uh, lifted so they could go about their businesses in order to have their livelihood and to continue to survive I think these were where the differences um, um, are between the two cities. 
Um, nevertheless, uh, we also experienced some um, experienced some um, uh, difficulties because um, because of um, the fact that the uh, price of food went up um, dramatically, as people were not sure when the lockdown, when the restricted movement was announced, whether it was going to be long or it was going to be short. So people were trying to get to the store and therefore the, the vendors and the traders also increased their prices dramatically. So that is was negative because then people who had little money could access um, very little and then therefore they would go in basically for the you know high calorie diets so that they um, they they can barely survive rather than you know choosing fruits and vegetables. Again, those who are vulnerable and therefore have no access to storage, like fridges or whatever, couldn't go for any perishable foods like fruits and vegetables because they don't have access to storage. So these are some negative things we felt that um, could you know perpetuate obesity and overweight and and the resultant um, NCDs. But luckily for us. The lockdown, the government listening to some of the, the, the concerns that were being raised by the public health and, and practitioners and then and cut short the restricted movements right after three weeks so people could, um, so that the vulnerabilities could be minimal. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Rajiv. There's uh, already questions coming in. This is from my colleague uh, Ruth Hall at PLOS, and it really tries to get a sense of the the broader background that you're investigating in the Rove study. Uh, we, we know that the, the South African and the Ghanaian food systems are very different. Uh, in Ghana, the informal food system is, 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 is much bigger and much more resilient, but there is supermarket uh, penetration and supermarket expansion, including from South African supermarkets. And one of the questions that has been exercising our minds for many years. In fact, I think it was one of the um, uh, motivations for the study is really, are South African supermarkets uh, exporting obesity into other African countries? Um, so um, what is your broad, maybe you can give it a, um, a COVID-19 spin, but what's the general, your picture of the general uh, uh, background um, to, that, uh, to that issue? Well, well, definitely. The, the general picture is that um, with the expansion of, you know, the large supermarkets in Ghana, and uh, not only in Accra but all the different parts of um, in, of, the, of the country, um, access to uh, obesogenic food. Um, clearly, we, you cannot um, you cannot dispute this. And when you and you know the way they they also they situate the big supermarkets um, as such that um, it's easy to access them and therefore people can go quickly and then and then be more fancy and more uh, elite. So definitely it is contributing. We cannot uh, dispute that. And and we see that expanding as well. And if, if you ask me, I think that we will, Ghana is closely, um, you know, it's, it's closely at the heels of South Africa trying to become uh, South Africa. So whatever we, we see in South Africa now, I see Ghana, you know, becoming that very soon if things don't change. But having said, I also want to Say that um, the informal sector is also um, a key source of obesogenic foods. So sugar sweetened beverages and then confectionery and, and others are also driven strongly by the informal sector. So um, the formal sector is expanding from South Africa mainly to into Ghana, but at the same time, the informal sector is also contributing to um, obesity in the country. Okay, great. I have a question for you both, uh, and maybe you can just go on, Reggie. Do you have data on uh, changing diets uh, during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown? Now, you, you did some very careful surveys of what people's dietary intakes were. You, we found some spikes in hunger, but do we actually have data whether people's diets became measurably more unhealthy during this time? Reggie, I'll begin with you. Well, I wouldn't say we have uh, such data, but we did some interviews um, to, to ask people what what their choices um, are and what they are considering. And we also went around and spoke to some of the you know the retailers to to ask them what what they what um, what they are 
preparing for what they are stocking their stores with in in mm. preparation for for the COVID. And um, so we won't have um, empirical evidence on how the diets have changed, but more of perceptions and, and, and for now. Yeah. Uh, Flo, the uh, question your side, do you have uh, data, adult, uh, reliable data on changing diets in this time? So, no, we, I don't have, um, I haven't seen any reliable data at this point in time about how people's diets are changing. Um, apologies for the sound quality. There's heavy rain here at the moment. Um, what we what we are seeing is that people are reducing their expenditure where they are able. We are experiencing or we are seeing large numbers of people reporting hunger. I'd say double or triple the numbers as opposed to pre-COVID. And what we know from previous research, and I, I wrote a paper about this in 2016, a working paper for PLUS, looking at the foodways of the poor in South Africa, that um, when we look at poverty dynamics, when people um, change from a situation of relative abundance to scarcity, so when people become poor, they economize on food. It's often the first thing that they can economize on. And so what they'll do is that they'll make sure that they can still cover their basic needs in terms of calorie intake by um, consuming the usual carbohydrate staples, um, mealy meal, bread, plus oils and sugar, but they'll cut out the things that are seen as um, being more luxurious, um, such as fruit and vegetables and so forth. So based on this previous experience, my expectation is that right now people are, are reducing their, their consumption of um, fruits and vegetables uh, drastically um, and, and sticking to the things that they need just to fill their bellies, uh, which ultimately are also foods which will reinforce trends towards obesity and, and uh, non-communicable diseases in the long run and will undermine people's immunity towards COVID. Um, so, but what you've you know, raised is really the the need for further studies in this kind of thing. And obviously at this point in time with the uh, risks of conducting research in the conventional way, uh, one is challenged to find innovative ways of, of actually conducting this kind of research and gathering data on what people are actually consuming. So this is a great need at this point in time to, to look at um, what people's dietary intakes are looking like right now. And we are exploring possibilities of evaluating uh, current dietary intake in, in one or two areas. But I think this is an area where much research, much further research is, is needed. And um, yeah, possibly one can include relevant components in, in survey instruments that are currently being utilized nationally. We're in conversation with Stats SA around this issue and um, also with colleagues at the HSRC and, and possibly they, they will be receptive to uh, evaluating changes in dietary quality as a result of COVID. Yes, um, uh, thank you, Flo. You, uh, another controversial and urgent topic has been the question of food prices. Um, uh, Reggie has already mentioned this in passing in the context of Ghana, not only were people uh, suffering a significant income shock but there was also lots of um, evidence, some of it quite anecdotal, about spiking prices. Um, sometimes as a result of, uh, of hoarding behavior by people who worried about food um, uh, um, insecurity and the length of the lockdown. Do uh, you have any view on the extent of uh, price hikes and also the, 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 the maybe you are also an understanding of what are the reasons for the price hikes and to what extent was there gouging and opportunist behavior on the part of either people in the informal sector or on the part of people in the, in the formal food sector? Okay. Um, uh, uh, Reggie, do you want to start? Yes, I can start. You, you know, one, for Ghana, I think that there was the fear that food couldn't travel from the villages where, especially fruits and vegetables, into the cities. So prior to the, the lockdown, the restricted movement, food and vegetables prices went up more than more than two times, more than twice. 
clearly and 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 so um so things like you know veg the tomatoes and 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 and, and onions and things that people consume daily prices went up more than twice in 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 Kumasi here and now and the people and um, the, the 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 stores the, the retailers said that they were not even considering store store and, and stocking um, their the stores with such food because after during the lockdown nobody would come and buy and they would go back. So people went in for you know rice and oil and sugar mainly, and prices of that also went up because um, of course um, retailers thought that um, um, this is the time to make um, the most out of people and take advantage of the situation. And there were times you hear people retailers saying that look we are taking advantage of the situation to make as much profit as um, we can. Okay. Uh, Florian, um, yeah. your take on the issue of prices in South Africa? I suspect that there may have been some opportunistic price gouging here and there um, with, with supermarkets. Uh, I don't have any data at this point in time. Uh, I, I believe colleagues at the Peter Maritzburg Economic Justice and Dignity Project um, are in the process of monitoring these things, and I'm really looking forward to seeing some of the data emerging from their studies. I also know that um, regulations were enacted very quickly to um, prevent this kind of activity, and that the um, Competition Commission also is monitoring the situation quite closely. Um, but I, I'm not you know, aware of any detailed information and stats at this point in time. I, I just know that colleagues who are monitoring this have mentioned price increases, particularly in, in the Peter Maritzburg area. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if similar things are taking place here in, in Cape Town. But um, we're still waiting for that data to come through. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Flo. So, so what is the big picture that's emerging here, uh, and what are the the lessons here about, um, in a way, the the virtues and the limitations of either a highly formalized food system like South Africa, or or the much more informal food system food system that that we have in Ghana. Um, um, uh, are there are there risks in greater formalization? Should we um, invest in more opportunities for the informal food system. Here in South Africa, I've been very struck by the debate between two very different groupings. On the one hand, um, uh, people like uh, Wandile Sihlobo, who writes for Business Day, uh, in a way arguing that the COVID-19 crisis vindicated the, the, the resilience of the formal system and showed that formal systems, food systems were, were working very well in keeping food on the supermarket shelves and other people arguing the opposite, saying that the crisis that we saw in the townships showed that they were uh, major questions. So there, there, are, there are lessons to be learned here, I think, both about how we should think about our food systems and also about the nature of the lockdown, because one of the things that, that's been flickering through our discussion is the very significant difference between the harsh and extreme authoritarian, sometimes brutal lockdown that we experience in South Africa, and a sort of a much more light touch lockdown in Ghana, maybe because state capacity is an even greater question in Ghana than, than it is in South Africa, and the food system is uh, more, more difficult to regulate. What are your views on this? Uh, uh, Reggie, maybe you can start. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are some advantages clearly for having the, an informal, a strong informal food um, system or sector because it, the access to fresh food is much higher. And, and these um, vendors, they, they provide, they, they, pro, they, pro, they prepare their foods. If it's meals, they prepare them daily. So you have access to fresh food all the time. And then they also um, to open markets where people are selling all sorts of fruits and vegetables that they bring from the farm every day and um, give you access every day. And usually prices are also lower because, you know, by the time these same fruits and vegetables get into a big supermarket um, and on the shelf and um, that's packaged in a nicer way and all that, 
but then the price would be maybe times two what you buy in as an informal um, market or a woman in, in an open market. The, the at disadvantage of a strong informal sector is regulation. And I always say that it's very difficult to know even where to start from when you want to regulate the things like you know price hikes that um, people are taking advantage of because the, it's, it's informal and everybody seems to you know be able to do what they want to do but apart from that the access to healthy food for me uh, unprocessed um, um, um food as, as well and um, is much uh, better within the strong formal system you know the former informal system so strong informal system also provides the um livelihood to many many more people so once it becomes so formalized owned by big giants and then controlled by big giants, fewer people have livelihood because so many people Ghana over 70% of um, our food is produced by small farmers and they would be out of jobs if this is then you know controlled by a big giant, a few big giants. Mm. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Richie. Florian, your views on that broad sort of more uh, ideological question about the uh, formal versus formal and their relationship to each other yeah well i think firstly i think we uh, it's important to recognize that that dichotomy is a little bit misleading to begin with um that that the these sectors are in fact quite closely linked and as reggie also pointed out that the small shops often provide access to some of the more problematic foods the ultra processed foods and so forth but um i i do tend to lean towards the side that is um more supportive of the informal sector. Um, my sense is, as Reggie's already pointed out, the informal sector provides far more livelihood opportunities. Um, from a, a COVID risk perspective, though, what we've seen is that some of the super spreaders or hotspots in, in Cape Town and the Western Cape have, in fact, been shopping centers, um, supermarkets. And what we know, and I mean, the knowledge around COVID is constantly changing and growing, but what we know at this point in time is that it is um, transmitted through aerosols, through breathing. And uh, some recent studies have emerged which have um, demonstrated that, uh, particularly in closed spaces where people um, are breathing air that has been recirculated through air conditioning, uh, represents a great risk because people are essentially breathing the same aerosols that have that have been breathed out by others who might be ill. So forcing a large number of people to access food through supermarkets is, is increasing exposure risk there and in queues and in taxis. Um, so it, that is one of one of my big concerns around this matter. Uh, the the informal also is internally differentiated and I think it's it's really important to recognize that we're dealing with a number of different things here. Um, and the street traders in particular have been disadvantaged uh, hugely. And uh, the way our economy is currently structured, the formal economy doesn't offer many job opportunities and the prospects of that changing anytime soon are, are small. Um, and we also know that some of the big retailers uh, routinely employ labor brokerages and such which expose people to fairly adverse um, employment conditions. So the informal sector really provides opportunities for people to um, establish and, and maintain livelihoods in the context of an economy which at this point in time seems to be on the verge of implosion. So to try and then um, further reinforce that by by sidelining the informal sector, by trying to emphasize um, and support the the big food retail sector, I think is is very very risky um, and and problematic from a from a larger economic structural perspective, from a livelihoods perspective, but also from what we know of the food environment within supermarkets. These are um, these are private spaces. They they are not really subject to a lot of state regulation and intervention. And anyone who, who moves through any of the, the primary big supermarkets um, and pays attention to what is being sold there will recognize how much of what is being sold, in fact, is ultra-processed food. And, and this is really a big concern from a public health perspective. Ultra-processed foods are essentially food products that have been 
um, produced in an industrial manner using various ingredients which themselves are uh, refined products or byproducts of the food industry. And um, they've been conclusively linked to a number of severe public health issues, non-communicable diseases like hypertension, diabetes, sorry, diabetes, obesity, cancer, and so forth. Have all have all been linked to, to increased consumption of these things, and and this is a large part of what we find in supermarkets. And very often, the fresh fruits and vegetables in supermarkets are what would be considered loss leaders. So they are sold, sometimes even sold at a loss, in order to get people into the stores. But a lot of what people are actually buying are these ultra-processed goods. So I'm talking about chips. I'm talking about um, instant noodles. I'm talking about um, mayonnaise, um, you know, a lot of these kinds of quick and ready to eat foods that people are gravitating towards more and more and snacks and so forth are ultra processed foods. In fact, um, a lot of people staple foods and we're not really aware of this, but um, if we look at how bread is produced in South Africa, it is essentially also an ultra processed good. Um, so is poloni, which was implicated in this other major issue um, that we recently had with listeriosis. So reinforcing the formal sector to me is, is a, um, a risky uh, proposition for, for a number of reasons, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Florian. And you've mentioned the issue of um, uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. Um, and one of our questions, Carl Grace asks whether there are any gender differences uh, visible here in the incidence of obesity, uh, diabetes, uh, and therefore uh, to people's um, uh, susceptibility to COVID. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think the Western Cape is a really strong example of this in terms of the gender differences in terms of obesity. We've got 73% of the uh, women in the Western Cape overweight or obese. And um, I think just over 40 or 45 percent of, of men. So there is a massive disparity there um, in terms of the, the incidence of obesity. And, and, um, and obesity in this case is something I think that we need to recognize as a systemic issue. It's not it's often portrayed as a, an issue resulting from people's lack of discipline and poor dietary habits. But in many cases, people don't really have much of an option based on poverty and based on what's available to people. Um, and very likely also to epigenetic changes as a result of malnutrition in, in the life of the mother or, or during um, the, the child's um, life in, in, in the womb, uh, people are more predisposed towards it. So I think the, there is a big gender difference, and I think we're likely to see this with COVID. I, I haven't seen any stats yet. I'm quite interested to uh, keep an eye on that, in fact. Um, as to you know whether there are any differences in terms of the severity of the illness progression in terms of genders, um, but certainly in terms of the non-communicable diseases and obesity. And I think what is also important to recognize is the link to gender-based violence. I think part of the reason we have such a high incidence of obesity in South Africa amongst women also is that women probably feel unsafe in a lot of public places, which makes it difficult for them to um, engage in the kind of physical activity which is a is a part one of the determinants of, of obesity um, and uh, the other thing is that as women are often the ones that are engaged in food provisioning they often have to travel long distances to access food and we had a very poignant story told by one of the people in Kailicha um, a woman who um, had to walk long distances to access food and was really worried about being attacked and being robbed uh, on her way to get food because she'd been previously attacked and shot in the leg in this way. And I think this is something where, again, women are far more uh, vulnerable to these kinds of issues, particularly in conditions of food insecurity, where people are more likely to become violent in order to access food or in order to access money. So I do expect there would be gender differences here. Yeah. Thank you, Florian. Uh, Reggie, uh, what's the picture like in Ghana, in, in South Africa? We've been very concerned and aware of major issues relating to uh, uh, gender-based violence. Uh, I'm actually not very well educated about the politics of gender uh, in Kumasi and other places. Well, um, I wouldn't 
the, the um, strong gender-based uh, based violence, um, but there are gender differences um, in, in all the aspects of each, um, things in, in the society. If you take obesity or overweight as an example, you'll find that in Ghana, almost 60% of the women, are, um, um, adult women, are either overweight or obese, compared to something slightly uh, close to 40% in men, and not up to 40%. And so obesity is clearly um, more in, 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 in women. And we know the COVID um, um, susceptibility, um, as well as um, the um, likelihood of dying from, from COVID is related to NCDs and obesity um, increases uh, risk for NCD. So we would expect that um, survival um, when a, a woman who is obese um, gets a severe form, if they get a COVID, um, is likely to be lower than, than, than men. And uh, obesity is linked to um, poverty and in, in, in Ghana and in many uh, low middle income countries. And so as we see more women being overweight and obese, it's also likely to be um, likely that um, poverty is higher in women. We, we have seen access to you know, um, assets and control of assets and decision making within the households um, to be um, strongly and uh, um, driven by or controlled by men and and usually women have little say um, in such households so that may also be a reason why they are poorer and because they are poorer they also consume um, the foods that increase their risk of obesity and therefore would have a higher risk of um, COVID related um, morbidity and mortality and I and, and so definitely um, the, the, the gender issues um, are, are key even within the COVID uh, situation. Thank you, uh, Reggie. Now here comes a question from uh, Ben Skuman, and it really, you know, we, we've been speaking very much about the food system and formal and informal, but a very important part of the picture are these social safety nets. And, uh, and other responses that can be mobilized by civil society and gov government. It's been a major focus uh, um, of both government and community action networks here, here in South Africa. Uh, um, Reggie, can you tell us a little bit about the NGO response and uh, also uh, social, social protection response on the part of the Ghanaian government? How has that shaped up? Um, well, during the the lockdown or the restricted movement, the government decided to, you know, give out meals to very vulnerable people. So these are street people, disabled people, uh, homeless people, um, and so on and so forth. And and yeah, one way or the other, that we identified. The meals were provided. Now the meals did not include any fruits. So we, you know, that th this was raised, but again. It was one meal per day, and definitely that would also not, you know, meet the requirement for somebody who is outside and can, does not have a livelihood and cannot um, access um, food. So um, we, a lot of the the NGOs, faith-based organizations, were also uh, giving out rations, food rations, but these were mainly um, high-calorie, then energy-dense foods like rice, oil, sugar, and, and fruits and vegetables were outside the, 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 the question. They were out of the question because of the perishable nature and also because um, people even didn't think that they were, did not think they were food in, in a certain sense. So um, these are issues that we raised during the, the lockdown. We have a feeling that um, the government and these NGOs also realized that it was not sustainable. And these were some of the calls to the government to not prolong the, the restricted movement or lockdown, and therefore they were called up. Yeah. Um, uh, Reggie, here comes a question which I actually want to throw at you. Uh, in South Africa, um, uh, we uh, used to be proud that South Africa had one of the biggest um, and most ambitious school feeding schemes on the continent. 
Uh, we know that the suspend that school feeding has been suspended uh, in, in South Africa, which has uh, doubtlessly exacerbated the crisis. Uh, can you tell us the, what the picture is in, uh, by comparison in Ghana? I don't know whether you have school feeding schemes and whether those kinds of schemes have been continuing. And then, Flo, I will I will ask you to come in and comment on the question for South Africa as well. Well, this, this is really an excellent question. I must say that I have not even thought about the school feeding program because the schools have been closed for more than three months now. I think somewhere in March till now. And the children at home and school feeding programs are not running because they only run when children come to school and they get one meal, one meal a day at school. They're not, they're not running. Now, I don't think anybody is asking that children who really depend on school feeding program because they have a good meal, one meal at, at school, and uh, what is happening to them, nobody has, I don't think has been mentioned at all. And, and but I think that it's, a, it's really a, a, a good question to, to, to ask what, what is happening to these children because they were actually had access to one good meal. Mm -hmm. Florian, the picture in South Africa? Yeah, I think the picture is dire, as, as you've alluded to, many of the school feeding schemes have closed. Um, this is one of the issues which recently also came up in one of the webinars that we conducted with the Center of Excellence on Food Security, uh, Food Policy and Governance Program. We had a, a webinar specifically around feeding schemes and um, civil society response to the hunger crisis that we experienced at the moment. And I recall a representative of the Peninsula School Feeding Scheme mentioning, though, that in some of the schools, feeding schemes have, in fact, continued. Um, but yes, the need is, is likely to be great. And um, in many cases, I know anecdotally that um, for many of these children, the, the meal that they receive in a school is often the only secure meal in a day that they would be receiving. So I, I expect that um, the closure of the feeding schemes would have a major impact on child health, child nutrition. Um, and, and that is of, of massive concern I mean, from a from a legal perspective, I understand that children's rights to nutrition are an immediately actionable right. So I believe the state has a constitutional obligation to um, to do this to 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 ensure that children have access to food. It's not as in uh, the right of of people generally to nutrition, which is a a gradually um, actionable right. This is an immediately actionable right. But the state is is not, I think able to respond to the need um, adequately. The need is just far greater than, than what the resources and capacities at the moment are. And I think here the role of the civil society sector has been immense. Um, but also, again, from this webinar that we recently conducted, there is increasing evidence of donor fatigue, um, that the, the funds are running out. Uh, there is also the, the problem that um, the funds available from government from the side of the solidarity fund and from other funds are rapidly depleting and uh, it's unclear exactly how this will be sustained in the long run uh, and again the the impacts of covid are only starting to really fully ramp up now i'm expecting there to be significant economic impacts um, as many of us may know in south africa i think we've uh, we're entering into what may become a, a quite significant recession. Um, so I suspect that the, the food insecurity situation and the hunger situation will deepen. And I saw one of the other questions, how long is it predicted before the needy can recover? Craig Peck, I believe. Um, I, I don't see recovery immediately. I expect that um, the situation is likely to, to worsen for, uh, for, for the foreseeable future and that um, the state with its current uh, austerity budgeting approach is actually shooting itself in the foot significantly and doing the people of South Africa a massive disservice. I think this is the time when a massive stimulus package is required to protect those who are most vulnerable. And this is also where some of the uh, proposals of a universal basic income grant should be seriously considered. This is not the time to be trying to cut corners and, and save money. Um, this is, this is, there, there are reserves within the state, this I've heard, uh, and the, this is the time, I think, 
actually from uh, state pension funds, in fact. So here's the time for officials to also see what, what can be done at a national level to ensure that this crisis doesn't uh, spiral out of control and, and uh, result in, in a huge um, trap for people over the next decade or two at least. So um, thank you, Florian and Reggie. Um, as, as we enter the closing minutes of this webinar, I'm, I'm thinking of and missing uh, David Saunders. And uh, I've often wondered what he would have to say during this unprecedented public health crisis and, um, and what he would have had to say about what a democratic politics of life, what a people-centered politics of life would look like, one that makes people partners and agents in their own health, uh, rather than uh, subjecting them to quasi-military style, style lockdowns. Um, so so um, I know both of you were colleagues of David's as well. So uh, if you were to address him now and just ask, what is the way forward for a democratic politics of nutrition and a democratic politics of life? In, in South Africa and in Ghana, what are the key lessons that you take away from this? Um, uh, Florian, you, you said a bit about this already, uh, so I'll let you say a few things, but I want to then hand over to uh, to Reggie for the final words. Thanks, Andre. It's, uh, yeah, it's challenging to, to try and speak on, on David's behalf. Um, he had such depth of knowledge and experience and was such an impassioned fighter for the rights of those who are disadvantaged. Um, Firstly, I think that there is far greater need for consultation and participatory de democracy. I think we have a, a style of uh, democracy here which is very centralized or has centralistic tendencies, at least from national government. Um, and I think that there's inadequate consultation here. Um, but we're also seeing differences in the approaches. I'm, I'm noting a, a shift in local government and in provincial government, particularly in the Western Cape, I've um, been privileged to be able to participate in a lot of consultation where the state is really engaging in more transversal approaches and in more participation. But I think that that is, that is a good start, but it is not enough. And I think in order to hold the state accountable and to drive change, we really need a broad social movement. And this is one of the points that David Sanders made um, is that as in the case of the treatment action campaign in the, during the, the AIDS denialism era, um, it, it really required a broad social movement where people were willing to go to the streets to protest and to demand their rights. And um, I'm, I'm quite appalled uh, that there has been so little critical discussion and so little protest around this issue. And it really raises questions about what are the priorities of the state? Whose interests is the state promoting, particularly at a national level? Um, and following on that, how legitimate is the state if it's not really following through on the developmental and transformational mandate, which was set by the Freedom Charter and by various other um, founding documents also that are embedded in our constitution. So these are serious questions and I think it, it needs to be um, advanced through broad popular discourse, through, through large numbers of people actually demanding their rights. Uh, thank you, uh, Florian. Um, uh, Reggie, uh, what, uh, what is your uh, message to the spirit of David Saunders and what do you think he would, his advice would be on the way forward uh, for Ghana? Well, well I think that he, he would probably be saying that we, we should focus on the vulnerable and, and provide support for the vulnerable and to engage with everybody and then get to hear what people do. And if you ask me, I would say that I feel that the Ghanaian government has done very well in responding in the response um, to the COVID and, and the engagement with all, all groups of people because um, they have been meeting all the groups at different points in time. There were a lot of stimulus packages that were announced um, everybody in Ghana, we have three water, no water bill for three months, um, half of electricity bill paid um, for three months, and the small scale industries and small stalls and, and vendors have all received some form of money. And so uh, you can see a strong social system to help the vulnerable. 
I think that the government, even calling off the lockdown after three weeks, was in listening to, you know, the voice of the people. And I think that those are some of the things that um, are positive in our response. And I think would be, you know, be um, 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 applauded by by David. Um, but I wouldn't say that there is no room for improvement. I think that um, we can do more. Uh, th thank you, Reggie and Florian. Uh, we're nearing the, the end of our discussion. Um, and, and the contrast between the, the authoritarian response in South Africa and the much more flexible and open response of the Ghanaian government is, is marked. And indeed, all over the globe, we're seeing how much of the path of the pandemic is being determined by the, the politics of, of the state and the ability of the state to engage effectively with people. Uh, so thank you very much for, for, for those thoughts. Um, we've reached the end of our discussion. Thank you, uh, uh, listeners, for participating and your questions. Um, uh, don't forget to tune in same time next week where we turn away from food security and look at the politics of conservation, uh, where my colleague Marfa Hara will be interviewing uh, Brown Busher and uh, Frank Matose from the University of Cape Town on the politics of conservation. Uh, that will prove to be a, a, a very interesting and lively discussion as well. Um, uh, so thank you very much for participating. Until next week, be well, uh, stay safe, uh, look after yourself and the people around you. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Andres. Thanks, Reggie. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you.